please welcome Tanay Pant from the great Mozilla. Uh, he will be talking to you about creating games with WebXR. The stage is yours. Postdoc Streamer, uh, how is everybody doing? Good. Uh, thank you very much for attending my talk on multiplayer games with WebXR. Today, I'm going to tell you a story. And this story is a compilation of different experiences. Some of them include my first experience with virtual reality, the challenges that I faced, why I felt that WebVR was the right choice to make, my love story with A-Frame, and various other experiences and thoughts as a result of which I created a series of demos. This story will take you through a journey where you learn to leverage various components and possibilities to create your own multiplayer WebXR game. This story has a slight element of nostalgia as we will be using the Pokemon universe for our demos. So let's get started. Uh, yes, that's me, despite the little resemblance. My name is Tanay Pant, and I currently work as an operations analyst at ResearchGate in Berlin. And I'm also a part of two really amazing programs within Mozilla, the Tech Speakers program and uh, the Reps program. Those of you who would like to know more about this, feel free to grab me after the talk. I'll be the guy in the red sweater. I'm also an Intel software innovator in the field of IoT, and I have published books on Firefox OS, building virtual assistant for Raspberry Pi, and web-based virtual reality. And of course, I love Pokemons, but we'll talk about that later. That's my Twitter handle, and I'll publish the link to the GitHub repo, which contains all the demos that I'll showcase in this talk. So keep an eye out that space. OK, last night I was debating whether to do this or not, but it's a two-day conference, lots of talks, lots of things to learn. So let's jazz up the energy in this room a bit. Um, so please bear with me for a few minutes. I'm going to request all of you to stand up. Take it just a few minutes. OK, so we will be doing something what I call the open web stretch. So it goes like this. First of all, we go up and reach for all the open source streams. Reach high up there. Then we go back down to the grassroots. We come back up, blow the winds of change. Then we reach in the front and shake the money tree for fundraising. Give it a good shake. Then we lean left to avoid the NSA. We lean right to avoid the KGB. Then we go all around to avoid both of them. Yeah, we are done. Thank you so much. Have a seat, please. <laughs> How many of you here have had any experience with virtual reality before? OK, half, 50-50. So my first experience with virtual reality was when one day my father got me this thing called Google Cardboard. And he simply opened an app and put his phone in. I particularly remember not having a very great time that day, probably because of my exams. But when I put the device on my, uh, on my face, it teleported me to a different place. I was suddenly sitting on the top of a roller coaster, and it was spectacular. It was love at first sight. And as time passed by, I did learn that virtual reality is not only good for entertainment and gaming, but it's quite essential and useful for other things as well. For example, if you're an engineering student, it really helps to visualize the models that you create with softwares like AutoCAD and see them in three dimensions. And if you're an artist or a painter, it's really interesting to be able to paint in 3D space with softwares like A-Painter or Tilbrush. And not so long ago, Samsung created a demo which allows people who have acrophobia, that is the fear of heights, to have a simulation where they are standing at the edge of a high-rise building. And that really resonated with me because I myself have a fear of unguarded heights. Speaking of heights, uh, yesterday I got the chance to roam around the lovely city of Novi Sad with some of my uh, friends, and we came across this iconic cathedral. And uh, now if you ask me to get rid of my fear of heights, uh, 
like this daring gentleman right here pulling off a Tom Cruise, uh, that would probably drive my stress levels through the roof. So VR helps us in overcoming our fears uh, or danger, the dangers that we feel in a safe, simulated environment. And this shows how VR can also be used for the betterment of mankind. Well, coming back to the story, time passes by, and now I'm in college. I have all the free time in the world, and I decide that I want to make a VR application. And by that time, there were already quite some SDKs and devices in the market. And the each uh, SDK was gigabytes in size. Gigabytes? Are you kidding me? Like, I had a quota of one gigabyte per day in my university, and my college was not that great when it came to internet bandwidth. And then if I did manage to make an app, I was doubtful that my batchmates are actually going to download those apps and run it on their mobiles, install it for testing. And these SDKs did have a steep learning curve, and you need to submit your application to the app stores, which act as a gateway before I can publish my app. There were just too many points of friction, and to be honest, it was quite demotivating, especially for a freshman college student like me. Then one day, I heard about WebVR. What is this? Can a browser even display graphics at uh, a good enough rate to match the performance of native apps? I was skeptical, to be honest. Uh, but then it did make quite a compelling case. It was open. Anybody could publish anything, because it's the web, of course. Different VR scenes could be connected with each other with the help of hyperlinks or portals. And one could have instant VR experiences. No need to install applications, no need to download a lot of data. You can just send over the hyperlink of your application to one of your colleagues or friends over Telegram or Facebook Messenger, and the person has just to click on it, as easy as that. Hmm. This indeed seemed like something that I would like to try. Moreover, I already knew JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. So I was really psyched. I was finally going to make my first VR application. And then I learned it's not that easy. There's just too many moving components to handle. How many of you have used uh, WebGL or 3JS before? Three people. So. These are two really crucial components of making a web VR application. And if you have used those, you might agree that they have a pretty steep learning curve themselves. You would need to install VR effects, preload assets, initialize the scene, set up lighting, camera, take care of the responsiveness. Ugh, I did not want to go through all this trouble just to create a small prototype. And that's a lot of boilerplate. And all this code would need updating with new version of the libraries. And if you haven't dealt with this before, you probably would be less, uh, less, you are less likely to create a Hello World VR program. And at this point, I was quite close to abandoning my dream of creating a VR application. So my exams got started in the university, and after a month or so, I came across this thing called A-Frame uh, on Twitter. So apparently, Mozilla started this new team called MozVR, and they were developing this framework. And I thought, OK, let's give this one last shot. Why not? A-Frame turned out to be a declarative framework for building virtual reality experiences on the web. Fair enough. As I started to go through the examples and documentations, I must say I was quite impressed. It was designed in such a way that it really made prototyping uh, easy without any, prior, uh, without any prior graphics knowledge. So this is a web VR world, Hello World program written using A-Frame. As you can see, it's just HTML. And one line of HTML, a scene, handles components like canvas, camera, renderer, all those things that we talked about. And for further development, we put our stuff inside the a scene tags. So let's take a quick look at what we have here. We have different primitive type geometries in this. And we have a box, a cylinder, a sphere. We have a plane on which all of this is sitting, and a sky. And this is what it renders. So you might notice that you can select the colors. Uh, you can set the position and rotation of the objects in x, y, z axis. And uh, you might notice that I've also included the script tag, which essentially includes the library. So no build steps required like in those SDKs. So 
A-Frame is an entity component framework. Have anybody of you used Unity, Unity 3D? Two, three, three people. OK, so it's a game development uh, software. And entity component is quite popular in uh, game development and is used uh, by softwares like Unity. So all the objects in the scene are basically entities that are inherently empty objects. And you can plug in components to which you can attach appearance, behavior, functionality. Hence, Entity Component Framework provides a really easy way to build up different kinds of objects. These are some of the components that ship with A-Frame. So in case you were worrying about having to recreate something like the Novizad Cathedral, it just boxes and cylinders, you can put your mind to ease because like, uh, there are different objects, like object model and collada model. So basically what they do is they allow you to import pre-built 3D models, which are in .dae or .obj format, and include them to your scene. And since A-Frame is fully extensible at its core, the community has filled the ecosystem with tons of components. And these components can do whatever they want. Basically, they have full access to 3.js and web APIs. And the component ecosystem is the lifeblood of A-Frame. You can simply drop these components as script tags and use them straight from HTML. So this is an example of advanced developers empowering other developers and working on collecting these components. These components are collected and made available in the A registry. So it's like a store of components. The A registry team makes sure it works well. People can browse and search for components or install them with a package manager like NPM from here. OK, enough talk. Um, before we move on, I would request you to close your eyes for five seconds and recall your earliest memories of Pokemon. It might be you watched them as a kid. You watched them with your kids. Or if you are, with, if you are like me, you probably fell off the stage or hit a door while playing Pokemon Go. All right. Let's take a look at a demo that I created. Is it visible back there? OK. So as we can see, this is just a HTML file. Here I have included the script tag, which basically calls the minified version of the A-frame library. Then we started the a scene tag. And here, as you can see, I have added the attribute fog. What it basically does is it obscures objects at a certain distance from the camera in fog. You can specify what kind of color you want for the fog. Then I have used something called the asset management system in A-Frame. So this allows you to preload assets to improve uh, the performance of your scene. And here I have started including basically all the free Pokemon models I could find online, and I have pointed I have pointed them to the DAE file. And here I have some images which I have also included in the asset management system. So I'm using one of them as a texture for the grass on the floor and one of them for the walls. And then I started placing these different entities all around the scene. So first of all, I included the Pokemon ball and I entered its position and scaled it a bit because some, most of the times when you will acquire these 3D models from the internet, they are either too big or too small, so you'll have to scale them to fit the size of your scene. Then I added animation to it so that it basically rotates 360 degree about its central axis. And then I took all the different Pokemons and placed them in a square formation with a Pokeball in the center. Then I took the primitive box uh, component that we saw earlier, and I added a material to it, which made it look like a wall. And then we had uh, the plane on which everything stands, and finally, a sky with a color added to it. So let's take a look at what that gets us. OK, everything works as expected. We have different Pokemons. We have a floor with grass texture on it. We have wall with kind of old medieval texture on it. 
So this is what a uh, scene created with A-Frame looks like. If you look on the bottom right-hand side of the screen, there's a goggles icon. So if you are in, uh, using, uh, if you have opened the screen in a compatible browser in your mobile, and you click on this, it will split your field of vision into two. So basically, you can put your mobile in something like Google Cardboard or any other headset. Now, if you're on your mobile moving around, moving your mobile around or moving your headset around will change your field of vision and just pointing it to some place. If you have controllers, then you can walk. But if you just have your mobile, you can point at a spot and it walks up there. If you are on a laptop like me right now, you can use the cursor for changing your field of view. And you can use the WASD keypad for moving around. So these are the different DAE models that I acquired from the web and created the scene. Now, if you remember, the, if you rem observed, some of these models had really absurd x, y, z axis. Like, what does minus 13.47? Uh, like, this is annoying. This is really annoying for prototyping. So to make things easier for prototyping, what A-Frame did was it in introduced an uh, inspector, which is quite like what softwares like Unity have. So if you press Control, Option, and I in your A-frame scene, this will invoke the A-frame inspector. So as you can see, I, I'm not sure it's quite visible, but it lists all the different entities that I have used in the scene. And then it also shows the A-box that have included Sky and so on. So we get an overview of the scene that we have here. We can zoom in to make sure everything is positioned correctly. We can click on objects and move them around. You can scale them. You can change their rotation. You can translate them, and so on. So it also shows here the position data, the rotation data, and the scale data that we have added to this object. And here it also shows what's the location of this file that you have included. So you can also, on the fly here, change things, uh, make changes to your scene. So I just included the Pikachu model here. And now we have two Pikachus. That's even better than one, one of them. So just a quick question. Like, I included the same file, which is the other Pikachu. Why is this one so big? Scale, Scale yes, perfect. So now we make changes to our scene using this A-frame inspector. And we can just download the HTML file, which will which will save all the changes that we have made. All right, let's move on. Since A-Frame is based on HTML, it is compatible with all the existing libraries and frameworks, like React.js, D3.js for visualizations, and so on. But playing in a virtual world is much more fun with friends. And uh, here's a demo which shows A-Frame using a component called Networked A-Frame. So what I did here was, in this scene, I opened two sessions, one with my mobile and one with my laptop. It's like a simulation of a conference room with different speakers in it. So if I tap the session from my mobile, it will give me feedback by waving its hands up. And if I tilt it down, it will look down. If I tilt it up, it will look up. And like tapping on the screen will give me feedback so that I know the other session is mine. So the thing is, what it does here is your web page gives all the information regarding the position and rotation of the device, and it syncs it across all the sessions that have been opened. So here I have done it using Firebase. And it, this component called Network A-Frame has adapters for WebSockets, DeepStream Hub, and many other real-time databases. So um, I was quite happy having made that application. I had a working VR application with Pokemons in it. But then I thought to take a step back and think about the term virtual reality. So we are trying to simulate something in a way that looks as real as possible. OK, we can probably use high quality models which are photorealistic. But, and they look quite real. But when I was thinking about this particular problem, I came across this game called Pokemon Go. How many of you have played it? Seen it, demos? Oh, not a lot of people. OK, so it's basically a game where uh, 
you have, where there are different Pokemons, you take your mobile and you probably a Pokemon might be sitting on one of the chairs and these Pokemons are geotagged. So certain Pokemons are only available in certain locations and then you try to throw a Pokeball at them and if your aim is good, it catches that and there's a leaderboard and so on. So it basically, what it was doing is it took the real world and added some amount of information to it. In this case, it was Pokemons, and that seemed almost real. That seemed pretty interesting. And I thought, hmm, AR seems like the real deal. Let's give this a shot, and this is much cooler. So I did some research, and I came across this library called ARJS. So adding a layer of information to the real world somehow made things even better. And ARGS had a seamless integration with A-Frame. So this is how it works. <clears throat> you have certain markers here, like this image called Hero. So this comes with three or four uh, preset markers. So these markers are essentially thick bordered square with some image or text within them. And whenever you take your mobile, it will open up your mobile or your webcam. It will open the camera. And as soon as it detects a pattern like this, it will display something. So we start by adding the script tag for uh, A-Frame AR, which is ARGS, and the same minified version of the A-Frame library. So here in a scene, I have added this tag called a marker, and I have pointed it to the preset hero because we'll be using this same image for our demo purposes. And then inside this a marker tag, we will add the information uh, that we want to display once this pattern is detected. So I took this example and uh, created one of my own demos, which of course has Pokemons in it. So let's take a look at the code. So same script files, a frame JS, ARGS. Then similarly, I have, like the previous demo, I have used the asset management system of a frame. Then we have a marker tags with the preset of hero. And I added a few models here. So one of them would be the same Pokeball, a bit shorter in size. It rotates about its central axis. And we have four Pokemons looking towards the Pokeball, like, it's, uh, like they're around a campfire or something. So let's take a look at what that gives us. So it asks me permission to take a view at my camera. Oh, I'm visible there. So I'll be using the same image, the hero marker that we saw earlier. And when this recognizes this pattern, it will show up the models that we have included within the A marker tags. So here's the Pokeball, and we have four Pokemons looking around it. I recognize Pikachu, Bulbasaur, Squirtle. Anybody knows the name of the fourth one? I heard something. Flareon, you're right. Thank you. <laughs> OK. Huh? Yeah. So uh, it's actually kind of more for the purposes that you have it printed in a form of a paper or something. And then you are uh, like using your mobile handheld device. So it's more on the surface. But uh, yes, it will. Uh, as long as it detects the marker. I mean, too much of a tilt will probably create an issue with the pattern, but seems to work fine here. Okay. So coming back to the story, uh, this was cool. Uh, we now had a AR, we now have an AR application which detects patterns and shows some 3D information. But using just the preset markers was not really that scalable or personalized. I wanted to get, uh, make a game, and I want quite some markers of my own, like having my name on it or having a particular symbol on it. So the great thing is that the creator of this library has provided us with a tool where you can upload your own image, and it generates a marker file and a pattern file. So if you go ahead and try out some of the tutorials that are on the internet, there's two things which you need to take care of. Is one of them is that 
the tutorials have an old version of ARJS in it, so custom markers don't work really well. So make sure if you are following a tutorial, uh, you are using the uh, most up-to-date version of the library. And second thing, if you are using, uh, if you are trying to include a text like your name or uh, something like hero, make sure that the background is off-white for uh, proper detection. So, well, this kind of suited what I wanted to achieve, and I wanted to create my own marker. So I created a demo for that. It has the same two script files as before, and we have the asset management system. But if you notice here, this time we have something slightly different. Now, instead of using a marker tags, we are using the a marker camera tag. The preset is not hero anymore, but it is a custom preset. And it has a type of a pattern, and the pattern file is located at that location. So you will down when you create your marker along with the JPEG or PNG of your marker, you'll also get this .bawt file. So you can include that here. And I have just programmed it so that it shows up a contact uh, image when it detects the new pattern. So let's take a look at what that gives us. So same as before, it will ask me permission for the webcam. So now if we show it the hero marker, it will no longer display anything because it is expecting a different type of marker. So I'm going to use a marker which has basically same thick square borders and uh, my name inside it. So when it detects this, it shows up a contact card where it has my picture, my name, and my Twitter ID. OK. How many of you have heard of .gltf files? GLTF format? OK, so it's a relatively new file format. So it is for 3D models, and uh, it's created or managed by WebChronos, which is the same group which created WebGL. And what it aims as, uh, in popular media, it's referred to as the JPEG of 3D files. And it, what it, the great thing about it is, is it minimizes the size of the 3D content, and it improves the performance of the 3D models. And A-frames so, uh, has a much better integration with GLTF, even better than .dae or .obj files. And these 3D models can bring in animation along with them. So I found a really uh, popular .gltf model, which, uh, which is a drone, and it's animated. So I wanted to uh, implement that to the scene. So what I've done here is added the A-frame file, the ARJS file, and have included a third component, which is A-frame extras library. So you can get it from the A registry. And everything is pretty much the same. I'm using the preset hero marker here. And I have added the GLTF model. It's the drone. And I have added another component animation mixer so that it can display all the different animations that this model brings along with it. OK, let's uh, take a look at what that looks like. So it expects the hero marker now. I opened the wrong file. So I'm going to open the correct one now. Hmm. Somehow it still opens up the custom marker. That's interesting. Oh, this is correct one. That was bizarre. OK, so now we have the hero marker. And this displays a drone on top of it. And this model, unlike the ones that we were using before, brings along an animation with it. And this animation can be utilized by using the A-Frame Extras library. OK, let's move on. 
So how many of you are web developers here? Oh, a lot of people. So um, well, web performance uh, is a very crucial part of any application. And A-Frame allows you to monitor the statistics of your application by adding just the stats attribute to the uh, ASCIN tag. So what I did here was I uh, enabled that. And because I have used no lazy loading, I just included all the different 3D models here. The performance is not that good. But it allows you to monitor various different metrics, like frame per second. So aim for a stable 90 FPS for the WebVR 1.0 API. It shows you number of textures, programs, geometries, vertices, faces, calls, load time, and entities in the scene. OK, one last question. How many of you know Google Tilt Brush? Used it or played around with it? Nobody? So uh, Google Tilt Brush is a software or an app which comes along with HTC Vive. So you basically have two hand controllers, and you, are, you have a room scale experience, and you are able to paint in 3D and create structures like this. So this is kind of off topic here in the Pokemon story, but I included this, fi uh, this slide to show you how powerful A-Frame is. So to demonstrate that, the Mose VR team constructed a 90 plus frame per second room scale Tilbush experience in a few weeks with just A-Frame. So in a nutshell, VR is fun, and A-Frame makes developing web VR content fun. So this concludes my talk. We discussed the various components which can be used to make uh, multiplayer games with WebXR, such as models in A-Frame, animating them, adding multiplayer capabilities, and leveraging AR capabilities. You can also utilize the many libraries uh, that a registry has to offer, like uh, random mountains or an ocean uh, or a body of water. And you can also use the physics library to add physics to your scene. So this will allow you to, for example, create a game where there's multiple markers hidden all over the conference menu. Uh, conference venue, and when you take your mobile, detect those markers, it shows you an animated Pokemon running around in some pattern. And then you throw a Pokeball at it, uh, use the physics library for collision detection, and then you can incre uh, increase your score. And of course, this score would be synced across various devices using a component like networked A-frame and a data real-time database. So I can't wait to see what all of you are going to make out of it. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I think we, we have five minutes for Q&A if yeah. there's anybody who would like to ask a question. There's one. Yeah, so, uh, so I'll reply to this in two parts. Uh, first of all, like A-Frame, you should think of it basically as whatever is possible in WebGL, it should be possible. It is possible in A-Frame because like 3JS abstracts WebGL. In a similar way, this is a higher abstraction for the 3JS library. So anything that is quite possible, such as reflection from objects and those kind of physics, it is uh, like quite possible here. So just to uh, give an example, uh, ba Babylon JS is another similar library. So it has like really interesting uh, demos where you have the game, which is called Doom. And it has like really photorealistic version of that and has things like shadows. And if you go to aframe.io, you can also see a, a demo called Museum, which kind of simulates a museum with statues which have like reflection shadows and so on. Uh, or something like that. So you can bundle that in basically any way you want. So if it's a small prototype, then it will just be a single HTML file. But whatever way you prefer to package web applications might be with NPM or yeah, it's just an HTML file, like any JavaScript, like lazy loading, anything like that, or 
any bundling can be done with that. Uh, depends on what you mean by a scene. So would you already have 3D objects? So uh, yeah, basically just you can import them with, uh, if they are in DAE, GLDF, or .obj. There's components which are inbuilt. You don't even need to include a different library for that. So just point to their location. And um, what you can do is, if you do not want to do that, make it even quicker, you can just use the A-frame inspector and add entity, just add the path, and just position them. And then you will get all the position and rotation data. So it's like, I would say as quick as in softwares like uh, Blender or something like that. There are no more questions. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Thank you. I'm hoping uh, something's going to come up out of it. Uh, maybe somebody's going to build something and share. Yeah. I, I hope you use the, uh, the official hashtag if you do. If you do start testing this thing, yeah. I'm sure you're going to follow and maybe answer any yes, subsequent of course. questions. Thank yeah. you very much. I'll be around the conference, so yeah. if you have any questions. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.